A quick thank you to all of my Patreons, and a special shout out to Lemu, Firebringer Axel, and Enigma Desu for pledging the higher tiers. Your support is heavily appreciated. So, key, huh? If you stumbled upon this video, welcome. I'm Manpig, and I like visual novels. That's all you need to know. Recently, I've been reintroduced to Key by someone I met in my local anime club, and ever since then, I found myself in another rabbit hole that has pretty much consumed my life, and I love it here. Key is a company and brand that just means a lot to me now. And with the company recently reaching their 20th anniversary and announcing more new works than ever before, it's safe to say that right now is a great time to join the hype and become a fellow fan of the franchise. As such, this video aims to be sort of a beginner's guide to Key as a whole. Specifically what the company is about, why I think you should give them a try, and most importantly, give you some advice on how you may want to do so if you're interested. So first off, the big question. What exactly is Key? Well, basically, Key is a game company known for making slice-of-life visual novels, and is one of the most well-known in the industry. Comparable to greats like the 7th Expansion, Saidv, and even my very beloved, Type Moon. Their works are held in very high regard, and have received anime adaptations that further increase their popularity. By far the most famous ones are Kyoto Animation's Anime of the Season trilogy, but I'll get into what that is later on. So what makes Key special? Let's get the obvious thing out of the way first. Key are the pioneers of what visual novel readers like to call Nakige, or crying games, and have coined the story formula that most other Nakige visual novels tend to follow. The main appeal of key stories are their emotional resonance, usually leading to readers or watchers crying to various scenes of the works. And another main draw is that their stories tend to be accompanied with various messages or lessons that encourage people to see the things that they've been taking for granted or just become better people as a whole. Key stories are essentially slice of life and romance drama hybrids, with premises that don't seem interesting per se, but the overall stories end up amounting to much more than was initially shown. Key has made 12 proper visual novels, 6 of which got anime adaptations, as well as 3 anime original titles. There are also other things like novels, drama CDs, and manga adaptations, however I'll be focusing on their visual novel and anime releases as I believe those are the easiest to consume, and also the ones that most people have seen as well. Most of their works have similar themes with the others, and appeal to similar audiences. However, you may find a few works specifically are especially similar to each other in tone. Key has three general groups like that, and if you enjoy one work from one of those groups, it's safe to say you'll like the others. So, where might you start? Honestly, whatever interests you the most. Key stories don't have direct connections with each other outside of a few easter eggs and references, so whatever interests you the most would be fine. I'll be going over each key work summarizing their plot, and you can decide whether or not you're interested. However, if you do want an ideal recommendation from me regardless, don't worry, I'll give you some afterwards. With that being said, let's go over each key work one by one, shall we? Key's first ever work was Kanon, their debut visual novel in 1999. Kanon is the story of a boy named Yuichi who returns to a city he hasn't visited in years. For some reason, he hardly remembers anything about the city or what he did there. However, he meets various girls who seem to have links to his past with it. Kanon is a story about the importance of memories, and the importance of being able to remember something, even if that memory may be painful. Compared to the rest of Ki, I'd call it the most simple, but it's still a very solid story on its own, and is in my opinion the baseline quality of what I expect from a Ki work. Basically, if it's worse than Kanon, it's not up to the usual standard. I should also mention, Kanon was made back when visual novels required age scenes to sell, so this one is unfortunately R18. Proceed with caution or just skip through the nasty parts. In terms of anime, Kanon received a solid 12 episode anime by Toei in 2002, and an extremely impressive 24 episode anime by Kyoto Animation in 2006. The Toei one is visually dated and has a negative reputation due to age, but honestly, I think it's surprisingly good for the time and also works as a serviceable adaptation. In fact, there's a certain arc in there that I think ends better than the other versions of Kanon, as well as having a neat anime original bonus OVA which is absolutely worth watching. So I'd say check it out, despite its age. Now the KyoAni anime, that's easily the most famous and also beloved version of Kanon, and for good reason. In my opinion, KyoAni's Kanon actually manages to improve a lot of the elements of both the original visual novel and the Toei anime. 
While it's not necessarily an accurate adaptation, it is also the only adaptation I wholeheartedly prefer over the source, and makes a case for my favorite anime adaptation of all time. The final act to me is far more powerful here than in any other version of Kanon. And if you ask me, if there's one version of Kanon you must consume, it's KyoAni's adaptation. It's absolutely worth the watch. Next, we have Air, made in 2000. Air follows a wandering hobo named Yukito who travels to a rural seaside town. He has a unique power called Hojutsu and travels the world with a doll to make money, both which he inherited from his mother, who also told him to look for a girl in the sky and save her. He is told that such a thing is his destiny, but what exactly that is is vague to even him. Once again like Kanon, Air is an R18 visual novel, so skip through the nasty parts if you don't like those. Aside from that though, Air is a story that's quite different to the rest of early Key in that it has a lot of mythical and historical elements that shine through in its true root called Summer, with a lot of lore from the past that relates into the main plot. More than anything though, Air is the work that brought Key the theme of family, a theme present in its most successful titles in the future as well. With Air, it focuses on the many kinds and forms of families there are, and what really makes a family a family. In terms of anime adaptations, I'd say Air has the worst luck of all of them. It actually received a 12 episode TV anime from KyoAni first, which, while relatively faithful to the plot, also rushes things a bit too much and lacks a lot of explanations for the lore, making it really confusing and jarring for someone who is unfamiliar with what actually happens. Safe to say that out of the KyoAni key anime, Air is the weakest and also the most dated. It's a fair watch if you read the visual novel and want to see the scenes animated, but not the ideal version of the story. The second adaptation was a film adaptation once again done by Toei. We don't talk about the Air movie. Uh, I'm moving on. When it comes to Air, there's no real proper alternative other than the visual novel in my opinion. The KyoAni anime can be enjoyed, but the visual novel is by far the complete and definitive experience. So unfortunately, if you're an anime watcher, I wouldn't recommend starting with Air. However, the work itself is still absolutely worth checking out in the long run. Third on the list is easily Key's most popular and well-known work, so well-known that it's more recognized than the Key brand itself, and if there's one story you've seen from Key already, it's likely this one. The visual novel Clan Ad was made in 2004, following the story of a boy named Tomoya, a teenage delinquent who is sick of the town that he was born in and his life until that point. Clan Ad's biggest defining trait is the true root, after story, which is most well known for going past the high school setting of the story and delving into the struggles of living in society, the responsibilities of having a family, and being in a constantly changing world. Clanad Afterstory is really what gives Clanad its heart and differentiates it with other keywords. And honestly, the entire visual novel is worth reading for that route alone. It's also worth mentioning, Clanad is when Key stopped making pure aeroge, and this was their first all ages game, so don't worry about age scenes here. However, Clanad did get an anime adaptation. Well, two actually, but like Air, the first one was a theatrical movie by Toei and uh. We don't talk about that one, just just push it to the side. Now this, the KyoAni TV adaptation, is what we want to look at. KyoAni's anime's main strength over the visual novel is its reduced content. Usually reduced content is a bad thing, but in Clanad's case, I'd actually argue it's more of a strength. Clanad's visual novel has a lot of content, which is good in concept, but it doesn't cover it all optimally. Basically, there's a lot of rushed and even pointless routes and side stories, most of which are changed or optimized in the anime, or even cut out entirely. It's actually for this reason that the anime is far more entertaining and keeps watchers more invested overall, at least on a first watch. In my opinion, this means it's actually better to go with the anime adaptation for Clan Ed first if you want to be hooked, while consuming the visual novel later for a more complete experience once you're already a fan. At least, unless you're willing to trudge through a lot of extra content without being sold on the franchise prior. It also received 14 extra short stories under the title <sighs> Official Another Story Clan Ad, On the Hillside Path That Light Watches Over, which were then released as another visual novel as Clan Ad Side Stories. These are small bonus side stories that were made after the original visual novel, but act as fantastic compliments to the original story. Clan Ad also did get another spin-off, but we'll talk about that one later. Now, the three works I've already gone over make up what key fans call the Season Trilogy. Kanon, 
Air, and Clan Ed are grouped together due to their similar art styles, atmospheres, as well as a prominent seasonal setting and symbolism in each story. Kanon representing winter, Air representing summer, and Clan Ed representing spring. Poor Autumn. As well as all three works being adapted by Kyoto Animation into anime that became more famous than the original visual novels on a worldwide scale. When people first think of Ki, the season trilogy is usually what comes to mind. However, with the next work, Ki began making slight departures in order to tell us different kinds of stories. And well, after the season trilogy, Ki's next story was very different. Rather than being a full-length dating simulator, their next work would be a very short 2-3 hour kinetic novel with no choices. Moreover, it had no involvement with Ki's main writer, Jun Maeda, and was instead written by Suzumoto Yuichi, who is most known for writing Air Summer Root, Utawareru Mono's Mask Games, as well as another visual novel I'll mention later in the guide. This story was called Planetarian, The Reverie of a Little Planet. Planetarian is a very short but simple story about a post-apocalyptic world destroyed by human weaponry. It follows a nameless junker who searches a city for valuables, who ends up stumbling into a rooftop planetarium where he finds a robot named Hoshino Yumemi, a relic from the long-lost past from when humanity was still a functioning society, who excitedly greets our protagonist as a new valuable customer, telling him to stay and watch the planetarium's projection. If Ki had a quote-unquote cult classic within its own titles, Planetarian would definitely take that cake. Rather than being based on drama or emotion, Planetarian is a bit more of a thought piece. It displays humanity in equally beautiful and horrific lights, showing the awful potential humanity can have through its broken world, while also showing us the beauty and amazing things humanity can and has done despite that. If a key fan has dived just a layer deeper than Key's most popular works, you'd be hard pressed to find one that doesn't adore Planetarian. For the short length it has, it also manages to be one of the most thought-provoking and touching key works of this very day. It's a must-read for anyone who likes key stories, and is both beloved and still stands out all these years later. It was adapted into two anime releases a whole 10 years after the original visual novel released, as an OVA, as well as a movie called Man of the Stars. The OVA simply animates the events into the visual novel while the movie is a recap of the OVA with a sequel story of the title name spliced into the beginning, middle, and end of the plot. Overall, I'd say the OVA is acceptable, but not an ideal way to consume Planetarian, as it's unable to adapt most of the monologue of the protagonist, and so a lot of the themes and thought-provoking ideas in the visual novel just simply aren't present. I also do not recommend watching the movie first due to the new scenes, as on a first watching, it's much better to focus on the main story first. So if you want to consume Planetarian, my recommended method would be the visual novel first, and then the movie. Cause it is worth watching that anime, and the film's sequel story is also just as equally powerful. Next, Key made that Clan Ed spin-off I mentioned earlier. The R18 Tomoyo After was made in 2005. Tomoyo After, as its name implies, is a sequel to Tomoyo's root in Clan Ed, focusing on her life with Tomoyo after her root. It's similar to After Story, but rather than focusing on the struggles of living in society, it focused more on the responsibilities people have as parents, and also what it means to be a family. Tomoyo After has never been adapted into an anime, unfortunately, and the only existing adaptation was a very comedic manga that sort of just completely misses the point of the visual novels, so I'd say it's a visual novel exclusive story. That being said, the visual novel is on Steam and even better, lacks the weird out of place R18 age scenes and replaces them with much more fitting new scenes to make what's considered to be a superior story. Let's hope Ki can do the same for their other heroine based spin-off in the future. Regardless, Tomoyo After is a solid visual novel on its own, and one definitely worth reading for fans of Clan Ed. After that, we have the big one. Little Busters Made in 2007, in terms of visual novels, Little Busters is Ki's largest work and is widely considered Ki's best one period by both fans and the actual staff. Little Busters follows the story of, well, the Little Busters, a group of friends whose youthful days are slowly but surely coming to an end. In this time, they decide to do one last thing while they're together, play baseball, while finding enough new members to recruit into their group to play the game. Including post-game content and the sheer amount of minigames, Little Busters is more than just a reading experience. It's a genuinely fun, quirky visual novel with each new route feeling different to the last. The story itself covers a large variety of topics and issues depending on the heroine. Furthermore, 
all of the roots and their messages cultivates into their true root, Refrain, which is considered one of the strongest, heart-wrenching, and most powerful stories that Kia has created, period, even compared to Air's Air Root and Clanet's After Story before it. As a whole, Little Busters has main themes of the importance of friendship, as well as maturing from youth to adulthood. Little Busters is a story that celebrates people's lives, the beauty of childhood, the importance of adolescence, and gives encouragement to people to lead their own lives into the future, however they may turn out or whatever they may be, and in my opinion is well deserved of the love it receives. It was so popular that Little Busters soon got an expanded edition that included extra roots after Refrain, along with an entirely new heroine, all which were received with a lot of excitement and love from fans. Little Busters also received a really good adaptation by JC staff. Compared to KyoAni's season trilogy anime, the Little Busters anime isn't as flawless as there are a few gripes here and there, but it's still a fantastic show in its own right and very satisfying as an adaptation despite what some purists may say. Similar to Clanad, Little Busters also received short side stories, this time released on the iOS and Android. The amount of content is a bit less compared to Clanad's, however if you're a fan of Little Busters, they're still worth reading if you can understand the language. Two years later, Little Busters would also get its own R18 spin-off from one of its heroines, called Kud Wafter. Released in 2010 as a sequel to Kud's Root, Kud's story has a focus on the difficulty of achieving dreams in a harsh reality, as well as recognizing that even in a world that seems to be working against you, you can do amazing things. Kud Wafter demonstrates much of the same in its own story. However, unfortunately at the time of making this video, Kud Wafter has yet to be localized, so there's no official way of consuming the visual novel unless you can read Japanese. There's a movie adaptation, but to my knowledge, it's a very loose adaptation. Unlike the Little Busters anime, this is absolutely not a replacement for the visual novel and acts as more of a highlight reel for the fans who have read it. As a result, there's no real way of consuming Kud Wafter right now if you're an English speaker. However, there is a fan translation made by Alka Translation in progress, so for Little Busters fans, just wait a bit longer. After Little Busters though, the company wanted to try different things. The main writer of Key, Maeda, thought he peaked in writing visual novels during Little Busters and instead wanted to branch out into other mediums. This led to the first original property created by Key that wasn't a visual novel, but rather a seasonal TV anime. In 2012, the 12-episode anime, Angel Beats, aired to massive fanfare and excitement. Angel Beats told the story of an amnesiac boy who wakes up in the afterlife with people going to war with a mysterious angel. And soon enough, it follows his daily life in the battlefront as he figures out what's going on. Angel Beats is Key's biggest departure from their usual formula since Planetarian, being far more action-focused rather than character-focused. Animated by PA Works, it was visually the most eye-catching key anime to date, and the prospect of key making an anime delighted many. Maeda wanted Angel Beats to be big. However, due to the 12-episode runtime, he wasn't able to give each character the focus he wanted. Despite that, Angel Beats became extremely popular, quickly becoming one of Key's most successful properties, and one loved by both Japanese and worldwide fans alike. However, as Maeda was never properly satisfied with the length, in 2015, Key decided to remake Angel Beats as a visual novel. Maeda wanted every character to get a root in it. However, because the idea was so big, Key decided to release the visual novel into six parts called Beats, with each beat having different roots in it. As such, Angel Beats' first beat was released in 2015, having one of the most varied choice systems in any Key game, with different potential endings and path options despite only having three roots. People were really happy to see Angel Beats being done even better, even bigger, so the hype for second beat was massive. And then, we never heard anything about the Angel Beats visual novel project ever since. It's been five years. <sighs> oh well. Angel Beats would become the first of three eventual anime original works by Key, all of which were written by Maeda and animated by PA Works. The anime original trilogy is considered to be a bit of an outlier to the rest of Key, as they take on a more futuristic and modern aesthetic compared to Key's usual nostalgic daily life settings. They had more elements of sci-fi and were more focused on overarching stories rather than being character focused, and exist in sort of their own bubble compared to the rest of Key's stories. Keep this in mind for the future two other anime original titles that I'll go over later. As for the next original visual novel, because Little Busters was going to be super hard to top, K 
he decided they had to do something big for their next release to shine on its own despite the massive shadow and expectations that Little Buster has made. So they just decided to do something completely different. In 2011, Key released their visual novel, Rewrite, their first major visual novel that had next to no involvement from Maeda, and was instead written by Tonokawa Yuto, Ryuki Shio 7 from 7th Expansion fame, and headed by freelance writer Romeo Tanaka. Rewrite follows the story of Tennoji Kotaro, who feels like he's wasting his youth. Although, after some supernatural occurrences, he ends up joining the school's occult club, and along with some random friends, ends up on a goose chase to find some paranormal phenomena in the city. Rewrite's proper premise is really hard to talk about, but I can mention a few things. Rather than being a slice of life and drama hybrid, Rewrite is more of an urban fantasy. Much more similar to stuff like Type Moon. However, it doesn't really offer any emotional scenes or even heartfelt messages of living, and instead is more of a supernatural adventure kind of story. Whether you'll like this or not depends on taste, as Rewrite is kind of controversial. While some key fans liked this new change of pace, others saw it as a strange departure. It did attract new kinds of fans that aren't typically key fans, however, so if the premise interests you, I'd say just give it a shot and form an opinion for yourself. Just don't expect this to be your usual key story. In terms of Key's library, this is probably the biggest outlier. There was an anime made for rewrite that lasted two seasons, as season one focused on the common route and season two focused on the true roots, called Moon and Terra. The problem with the rewrite anime is that rewrite's character roots are basically impossible to adapt in a linear fashion. So what the anime did instead was make an anime original route that didn't really focus on any heroine and was more of a group dynamic. This anime is even more controversial than the visual novel itself, although I actually say if you've read the visual novel, the anime is worth watching as long as you go in with the knowledge that season 1 is not aiming to be a faithful adaptation. If you keep the fact in mind that it's an alternate story path, you may actually find the story of the anime to be stronger than what diehard rewrite fans might lead you to believe. And hey, the route was also made by Romeo Tanaka, which is rewrite's main writer, so it's not like it's slandering his vision, cause... This is his vision. Just read the vision novel before you give it a shot. A year later, Rewrite would also release its fan disc, Rewrite Harvest Festa, which gives sequels to certain routes and alternate versions of others. It does what a fan disc is supposed to do, show off the characters more and exist for fans who want more of them. Along with Rewrite itself, it is soon getting a translation and localized released on Steam in 2021. So if you're a Rewrite fan or interested in becoming one, now's the time to get these visual novels legally, cause it's been a long time coming. Also in 2015, not only was Angel Beat's visual novel coming out, but he and PA Works collaborated again to create Key's second anime original title, Charlotte. Once again running for another 12 episodes, Charlotte tells the story of children with supernatural abilities. The protagonist, Otosaka Yu, is a self-absorbed boy who abuses his power to take over other people's bodies. However, he is stopped by the Hoshinomi Academy School Council, who find and keep people with supernatural powers in control. Yu is forced to join this council and help Rain and other people with similar abilities to keep them all from abusing it like he did before. Compared to Angel Beats, Charlotte did get its fair share of hype but ended up being one of the more controversial keywords, if not the most controversial keyword. Whether or not you enjoyed Key's other anime original works, the story suffered from strange tone shifts and pacing issues due to its short length. Charlotte had its fans, but in terms of Key, it's definitely one of the lesser appreciated works. I'm not saying don't watch it, if you're interested go ahead, but regardless of your opinion with it, Charlotte is not indicative of Key's usual storytelling or even quality. Now while Angel Beats was financially a massive success, in terms of reputation, Key had been going on a downward slope. A reason for that was the simple fact that Galge visual novels simply don't sell as well as they used to, but another was due to them taking too many risks. Basically, Little Busters was so loved and successful, the company saw it as the best visual novel they would ever make with that kind of formula, so instead of trying to top it, they just tried making different kinds of stories that broke off from their original purpose. With Rewrite being an urban fantasy, and their anime originals having sci-fi aesthetics and being more focused on action rather than character dramas, a lot of classic fans have been drifting away from key releases because of these different tones, and over time, their pieces became more and more controversial especially with Charlotte having the most negative views on a key work ever. So why am I saying this? Well, after such massive changes, some fans were looking for a proper return to form from Key, or at least, a story that's much more closer to their classic works. 
and well, soon, they would get one. Their publisher, Visual Arts, hosts a competition called the Kinetic Novel Award, where artists, writers, and composers could submit their pieces in hopes of having their works being published by their branch companies. One of these pieces was called Todoketai Melody by Tsuzuru Nakamura, and it was lucky enough to get the eye of Ki. So for their 15th anniversary, they worked with Nakamura to create their new work. In 2016, Ki released Harmonia, their second kinetic novel over a decade after Planetarian. It's another short kinetic novel of a boy who wakes up in a factory that creates robots. He surmises that he is a thyroid, a robot made to bring humans happiness. And so he wanders out in search of humans only to realize that the world is deserted. He eventually collapses, but wakes up in a church where he meets a joyful girl named Shiona. Being a thyroid, he stays with Shiona, and works with her to bring happiness to the people in the town he's found himself in. Hearing the premise, you're probably thinking, hey, isn't this really similar to Planetarian, with the whole robots in post-apocalyptic setting? And on the surface, yes, but the similarities end there. Planetarian is more of a thought piece that looks at humanity, while Harmonia instead is much more similar to a full key story at a smaller length, and has a general theme of emotions, how important they are, and what truly makes a human, human. Harmonia itself is considered one of the weaker visual novels by Ki, and it's mainly due to length. Ki's typical formula is mostly effective because it's built on characters that have lengthy focus and development. However, Harmonia, only being a couple of hours, couldn't really do that. Despite that criticism though, Harmonia was still an obvious return to the key formula that was beloved by so many fans, being an emotional story with powerful messages, and thus garnered heavy praise from that aspect alone, which would be kept in mind as Ki would then make their next full-length visual novel project. In 2018, Ki released what is currently their latest visual novel, Summer Pockets. The story is about Hairi, a boy who is burnt out on life, so his aunt Kyoko invites him to the island of Torishirojima to help him unwind. It's there he meets several new friends and characters who welcome him, and Heidi then spends his time on the island in order to enjoy a summer vacation, one that will hopefully give him the push he needs before he returns to his daily life. Summer Pockets is a story of finding lost things, as each of the main heroines and Heidi himself have sort of lost something in their lives, and their roots is about helping each of them find what they lost so long ago. It culminates into its true roots, Alka and Pocket, which ties the messages of all of the earlier roots into one that links into having hope for a happier future, and not running away from painful things. Due to this obvious return to form, and also fantastic storytelling, Summer Pockets quickly became one of Key's most beloved recent works. What made people love Summer Pockets so much was that it harkened back to Key's older storytelling and refines it being a story based on a relaxing slice of life story with a hint of mystery, emotional moments, and an overarching message that ties all of it together. Summer Pockets is a work that feels like a return to form for Ki. Despite having very little influence from its main writer, Maeda, it feels most similar to Ki's older titles out of all of their new works, while being able to refine the formula instead of trying to top Little Busters. Summer Pockets' success is evident with its second upgraded version being announced only two years after its release. In 2020, Summer Pockets Reflection Blue was created as an expanded version of the original game, doubling the amount of roots in the original version, creating a brand new heroine for the story, and adding even more refinements to the original plot and minigames. With all this attention on it, it's not hard to see that Summer Pockets is currently the icon of modern era key and is a good sign that the company still has the special, unique touch that they had from their beginnings. Finally in 2020 debuted their third anime original title, The Day I Became a God, or Kamisama Day. Kamisama follows Yota Narukami, as he meets a young girl named Hina who claims that the world is ending in 30 days, and thus decides to spend those days with Yota, as episodic shenanigans soon ensues. As I'm writing the script, the final episode just dropped hours ago and I've just watched it. Kamisama Day is definitely the most similar to regular key out of the key anime original trilogy, but it falls short of the company's usual standards mostly due to a lack of focus for important cast members in the beginning of the show. It's definitely the least action-packed out of the anime original trilogy, so if you like the anime original trilogy's works and want to see that kind of structure in a more typical key setting, you might want to give it a shot. But overall, Kamisama Day seems to just be an average kind of show and somewhat underachieving for what the company usually puts out. With that being said, 
We're up to date with all the key works ever made, and hopefully one of them has caught your interest enough to give it a shot, as well as use it for your entry. Key's works are relatively similar to one another, with the exception of the anime original trilogy. So if you like one, there's an extremely high chance you'll enjoy the rest. But you might be thinking, you haven't quite made up your mind or may be unsure if your preferred choice is a starting point. And don't worry, I'm happy to give you my personal recommendations as well. However, I've just noticed, this script is getting really long, so I'm going to be splitting this guide up into two parts because I do not want to make another one hour video. So, in part two of this guide, we'll be going into my entry recommendations, some upcoming keywords to look forward to, and other visual novels that have similar links to key. For now though, I'll be taking a short leave. And before then, I'll hopefully see all of you somewhere else on the internet. Until then, take care.